Good day, dear viewers. You're tuned into the interview on Gold TV Africa with Paisalo Goibi. Now, today I have the privilege of having a guest in the house, a very distinguished, reputable person. And before I introduce him, I would like to give a summarized biography of him. Now, Stephen Adebandi Akintoye, also known as S. Bandi Akintoye, was born in 1935, a Nigerian born academician, a historian, and a writer. Now, he attended Christ School at Nigeria from 1951 to 1955 and studied history at the University College, Overseas College of the University of London. And also in Ibadan, he had his doctoral studies from 1963 to 1966 at the University of Ibadan, where he was awarded a PhD in history in 1966. He taught at the history department of Abafemi Awolowo University, Great Ife, Ile Ife, Nigeria, where he became a professor and a director of the Institute of African Studies from 1974 to 1977. Now he is our guest for today. He is also the former senator of Nigeria and the leader of the Yoruba self-determination movement. Very good day to you, sir. How are you doing today? How are you? I'm very fine. I'm glad to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. All right. Now. So, sir, let's get straight to business. Now, a couple of days, the Independent National Electoral Commission of Nigeria warned that the 2023 general elections, which is just a month away, faces serious threats of cancellations. And this is considering the waves of insecurity that has bedeviled Nigeria. Now, how do you access this statement? Well, they're telling the world the truth. Nigeria is not in a position to hold an election. There is too much uh, insecurity in the land. Uh, people are being killed every day in all parts of the country. Thousands of people perished by the day. Uh, and uh, the situation is not one in which you say you want to hold an election. Uh, the answer really to Nigeria is not an election now. It's a, a, it's a responsible, responsible, carefully handled uh, interrelationships among the leaderships of the various nationalities of the country so that we can decide where we want to go. And where we, Yoruba, the largest ethnic group, the largest nationality in the country, want to do, go is to exit Nigeria, to, look, to leave Nigeria and, and start a country of our own. Sometime in January, on the 9th of January to be precise, 2023, one of the Yoruba activists was killed by the police on Monday, the 9th of January, during a rally organized by the Yoruba Self-Determination Movement. Now, can you throw more light on what actually happened? Well, uh, the right to rally at all is the right of every human being in the world. The right to rally for self-determination is the right of every nationality in the world. Uh, so when our young people came into the streets that morning uh, wanting to rally for Yoruba nation, they were doing, they were totally within their rights under the law. Uh, but Nigeria is what Nigeria is. It's a land of savagery, of brutality and barbarism. So uh, a policeman came out, saw them gathering together for a rally, asked them, what are you doing here? They said, we are here to rally peacefully for the self-determination of the Yoruba and he just shot one of them. Uh, that's Nigeria for you. But it, that's not the end of the story. We are going to court to seek redress for the loss of that life. And uh, people know that when we Yoruba go, we go. We are very capable. Yeah, thank you. All right, you're welcome, sir. Now, can't your movement, Yoruba self-determination movement, organize, you know, collaborate with the police force or the security forces in Nigeria in such a way that there will be no situation of bloodshed? What you are required to do under the law is to inform the authorities that you want to hold a rally. Once you inform the authorities that you want to hold a rally, you are within your right to hold a rally. That's all. That's the only kind of co uh, co uh, cooperation. You may, if you like, ask them, can you please send some policemen to come and protect us? If they say yes, okay. If they say no, okay. You go on and do your rally. Nigeria is a land uh, apart from the rest of the world. <laughs> that, that's the truth of the matter. Now, many educated Yoruba people who are sympathetic to the idea of an independent Yoruba nation view Yoruba agitators, especially the agitators operating on social media, as individuals who lack 
you know, they are not polite, they are rude, and they are aggressive. Now, what is your movement doing to ensure that they are not associated with the struggle, but to ensure that they do not also compromise the struggle? Yeah, uh, the crudeness that you see on social media among uh, some Yoruba is a product of the Nigerian experience. Mm. We are not like that. Yoruba people are not like that. We are known all over the world to be polished, polite people. And that's why people like the Yoruba people. Uh, but the crudeness, the barbarism that you see on uh, social media now among Yoruba people is a product of the Nigerian experience. And by and by, it will go away. Especially when we have our own country, that kind of barbarism will go away. Now, moving over to Francophone Africa. Now, many Francophone observers, especially in the Pan-Africanist movement, now they perceive your self-determination struggle as directed against a particular ethnic group dispersed in many West African countries like Senegal, Guinea-Conakry, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Benin Republic. Now, how do you react to this statement? No, we are not. Uh, our so, uh, our self-determination struggle is not directed against any ethnic group, any particular ethnic group. It's directed as freeing ourselves from a country that has collapsed. That's all. A country where there is not, nothing is sure anymore where our people are being killed in the hundreds every day, where we cannot, uh, our people cannot drive on the highways without being attacked by bandits and, and kidnappers from the bush. And these are Fulani people. That's the truth of the matter. We are saying that they are Fulani because it is true. They are Fulani. And they make uh, the noise that they, they, are, they are coming to conquer all the uh, non-Fulani peoples of Nigeria, subjugate us, uh, uh, wipe out those who will not surrender to them and take our land. The Fulani have never had a homeland anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. They migrated into Africa, into West Africa through the Maghreb and uh, they uh, accumulated mostly in the area of the Futajalon Hills and they have been migrating westward since then, uh, eastward since then. And they finally reached uh, what is now uh, northwestern Nigeria in the uh, late 18th century. Uh, and unfortunately for us, black people, our largest nation in the north, in what is now northwestern Nigeria, uh, accommodated them in a way that gave them control over the lives of the, of the homeland. And so now what they want to do is to repeat that, to replicate that all over Nigeria. And they have been planning and really doing everything in that direction. In, uh, uh, for instance, uh, indoctrinating their people, telling their people, Allah has given us all of Nigeria. Allah has asked us to go and conquer and subjugate, uh, subjugate all of Nigeria. And so we are going to do it. And they have been doing everything in that direction. So, uh, uh, I mean, they are, they are, they are herdsmen. And uh, I, the president of Nigeria himself, who is a fool, and he made a public announcement, public announcement to the world. Actually, he made it not on the soil of Nigeria. He made it in another country to say that anybody from Africa can come to Nigeria without any travel documents whatsoever. And that was uh, a coded message to the fool, and it will start coming. Now, let's now go down the history lane. Some of your critics claim that in 1983, you betrayed Walu's UPN party when you defected to the MPN party with Omobori Owo. Please, can you clarify what happened? Uh, it is one of these uh, uh, primitive lies that people tell on uh, social media. They don't know the truth or they won't learn the truth because it's there. The newspapers are there. If you want to say a thing like that, you go and check up. Uh, in 1979, we elected our old man, a father to all of us, Chief Hajashin, and asked him to be governor. And a young man, one of us, of our age, a little older than myself, uh, stepped forward to offer to be his uh, uh, deputy governor. And the old man accepted him. It was lovely. No problem at all. Uh, then within two years, they were, uh, uh, the young man had organized a, a crowd of young people and they were sniping at the old man and making life impossible for him. I was in the Nigerian Senate in Lagos. 
And we who are in the Nigerian Senate in Lagos held a meeting. What is this happening in our own state? And uh, I was asked to go and find out. I went home, I held meetings all over the place and so on. I went to the House of Assembly. They accepted me and, and listened to me respectfully. And I said, this is a negation of the unity, the, the family atmosphere that we, you, you, UPN, are creating. Why is Ondo State now breaking up? Uh, now they were angry. They don't want Ajashi anymore. They, uh, so I discovered that what they really wanted was to put a young man in the, the young man in a position of governor so that Ondo State too can begin to be part of the corrupt leading states of Nigeria so that they too can begin to share money. It was happening all over Nigeria. State governments were breaking up as a result of uh, fighting over money. In Bendel State, I was the secretary of the committee that went to, to organize a settlement between the governor and the House of Assembly. Uh, the committee was led by Mrs. Odin Amadu, vice president of the UPN. And I, as assistant national secretary, went as the, as, as the secretary to that committee. So I knew what was happening. I knew that that's what they were doing. Ajashin would not touch public money. No way. If, in fact, uh, the, 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 this uh, security vote that people are now talking about came in at that time. And Ajashin said, we call this security money, or you don't call it security money. It is still public money. Therefore, we cannot share it. And they didn't like that. They didn't like that at all. That's why they were fighting him. Uh, so we tried to settle this tru the trouble. It won't go away. So finally, we invited our father, the leader of our party, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, to come in. He came in, held a meeting for two days with us. It was not, it was not going to go away. Uh, there were uh, people who were even lying that Omoboro was uh, uh, is, the, is the favorite of Chief Awolowo, and so on and so forth. And I held some meetings. And uh, a lot of uh, the uh, prominent citizens thought, well, the answer is another candidate who will show Omoboriowo that he doesn't have the, the uh, uh, monopoly of youth. So another young man who is a little younger than Omoboriowo himself, but who is sane, who is loyal to the party, loyal to Ondo State, and so on. So uh, I protested, I wasn't ready for an election, and so on. Finally, they asked me to come in. I came in. And uh, they were making a noise that the equity people have all 100% decided that Omaburo will be uh, their next governor. So I went in there. It belongs to me, too. So I went there, and within a few days, actually, pushed them out of a number of, of equity towns, you know and so on. And it got so bad that they organized the killing of a people in Ekiti. I was in Lagos. Chief Ajashin phoned me. Banji, they are killing people in your town. So I rushed back to Akure. It was a terrible day. And went to see Chief Ajashin. And he said, OK, let us go to Adokiti together. And we went to Adokiti together. And we went to see the families where Maburo's people had killed people. And uh, it was terrible. At that point, I thought, well, maybe since it has come this far, Baba, what should I do? Baba said, stick in there, because you are the one person making it impossible for them to roll over a kitty. So I stood in there, and the nomination came, and Chief Ajashin won. And within an hour, I was on television in Akure announcing that the nomination exercise is over, Chief Ajashin has won, and I and those who support me are supporting him within one hour. If it wasn't even one hour. I just left the place where the election, the nomination thing was read. I went, I was staying in Professor Luko's house, and my crowd was already there. And I just said to them, listen, we are going to make a statement now. They said, we approve. So I went in, changed my clothes, and I got the television people to come and record. We are supporting the winner of the nomination. That is Chief Ajashin. 
and the Omoborowo people got very mad at me, and so on. Uh, uh, and then we went on. The, the, the truth of the matter is that in a free and fair election in Ondo State, none of us could beat Ajashin. Uh -uh. He was too prestigious for that. He was too well-known, too well-loved. Everybody knew he was not a corrupt person. So he won easily. But before, uh, uh, before he won, Amaburo decided that uh, he could win. Before election came, he decided that he could win, that the crowd of young people he had gathered could make him win. And uh, how could he do it? He couldn't. He had been thrown out. Of, he had been thrown out of the nomination in uh, the UPN. He would go to the other party. He would go to the other party. When we had it, was, many of us went to counsel him. Don't do that. You are walking the path of total destruction. Mm -hmm. You have lost. Uh, I made a public statement. My brother, listen to me. You have lost a battle. This is not the war. The war is your total life in the politics of this area. And uh, well, he wouldn't listen. And so he went and joined the NPN. And of course, we walked against him and he lost grandly. But that is what one reason he went to the NPN. NPN was a crudely corrupt organization, crudely corrupt. They were going to rig the election for him. They assured him they were going to rig the election for him. And uh, I was the representative of Fajashin in the final collation of the results. I was his, uh, his representative, assisted by a young man called Alex Adedipe. And uh, uh, they were trying to rig the election, and we held them on. For three nights, they could not do what they wanted to do because I was there. Uh, then they began to threaten our lives. And at 2 a.m. on Tuesday, the election, we started working on the, in, at the election, the coalition center on Saturday at 2 a.m. On, on Monday, on Wednesday morning. Uh, it became so dangerous. They were going to kill us. They were going to kill me and Alex Adedipe. And uh, Chief Aula was called, uh, Chief Ajashin from, uh, from Ikena and said, uh, Chief, you must withdraw those boys from, from what I'm hearing here in Ekene. If you don't withdraw them quickly, both of them will be dead soon. So uh, Chief Ajash ordered us to leave. A few hours later, they began to announce that Omar had won. Mm. And uh, the greatest disaster I have ever witnessed then followed. Before they had finished announcing in the morning at about 5.30, 6 a.m., the whole of Akura was burning. Our young people had revolted. And it, it was terrible. Many of the uh, young men who had followed the Maburo War into the NPM were killed in the streets or in their houses. And uh, they don't like what I am doing. So therefore, the answer is to, uh, to, uh, to tarnish, tarnish my name. Your image. Which they cannot tarnish because the records are there. Yeah, that's the truth of the matter. I was the representative of Chief Ajashin at the final collation of the results because I stayed with the party. Throughout the day of election, I was everywhere. And Chief Ajashin was called, Manji, where are you? Everybody, if they see you in a what? They see you in a cocoa where? I said, that's my duty as assistant national secretary of the party. You know, finally he called me, he said, come back to Akure. Send somebody to come and get me to come to Akure. And he said, you are going to represent our party in the, you are going to represent me and our party in the final collation of the results. And I said, okay, sir. And I did it. And I was at the, the Federal Electoral Commission office for three nights, working for Chief Ajashin and the party. And now some uh, kid, some ignorant kid says, uh, <laughs> so no. I couldn't make any friends with Omaboro to the end of his life. Okay. I couldn't. He was, too, he was too bitter. I wasn't bitter. I did what I thought was right for our people. But he was bitter. And so that's it. 
Okay, so let's talk about your new book, The Fulani Factor in Nigeria's Decay. I said, to some, this book is deemed controversial. Now, in this book, there was a statement you made that the Fulani people are living in fear. So what does that mean in the context of the book? They're living in fear because uh, they've made themselves backward. They didn't have to be backward. When education came through the missionaries and the British, everybody could avail of it. The Yoruba people stepped forward and availed of it mightily. And by the 1860s, they were already producing gra university graduates, lawyers, doctors, engineers, and so on. The first newspaper to be published on the African continent was published in the city of Abel Kuta in 1859. So uh, by the time the British amalgamated Nigeria in 1914, uh, all the peoples in Nigeria together in one country in 1914, the Yoruba were far away, ahead of all of everybody in matters of education. Uh, as I said, the Yoruba people were already producing university graduates by the 1860s. But there were many parts of Nigeria which did not see schools, elementary schools, until the 1920s. So that's the situation. The Fulani could have availed themselves of that, but they didn't want it. They didn't want it. Even when Chief Awolowo died in 1987, one of the highest Fulani men, uh, political leaders at the time, made a very interesting statement. He said, well, I condole the Yoruba people for the loss of their leader. Chief Aulo loved his people, gave them free education, and raised them above all the other nationalities in Nigeria. If we had allowed him to, be, to win the election and become president of Nigeria, he would have, have done the same for the whole of Nigeria. Mm. But we Fulani don't want it. <laughs> That's it. That is it. That is it. I was in the Senate from 1979 to 83, and I had the same things over and over again. And sometime uh, about February 1982, I went to see Chief Awolo and told him, um, uh, I am not sure we are doing the right thing, sir. He said, what do you mean? We are trying to, we are proposing free education for all Nigerian children. Education is the birthright of all, of all every Nigerian child, and so on and so on. And people are accusing us that we are trying to push something in their mouth that they don't want. A few months before I went to the Senate, I was a member of a national commission, National Antiquities Commission. And we, were, we held meetings across the country. And we were holding a meeting in uh, Sokoto, and uh, and uh, one of the uh, big men in, 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 the, in the conference from Shokoto State came to me and said, uh, Professor, I hear you are one of the people helping Chief Awolowo to uh, put together this big educational program for all children. I thought he was going to, to be nice to me. Acknowledge your Acknowledge, hard work. Yeah. So I said eagerly, I said, yes, yes sir. Yes, of course. Yes, I said, yes, sir. He said, so you are one of the young men who will put me in prison? Wow. I, I said, how, sir? What, how has prison come into it? Because I hear that uh, you and your whole of are proposing that anybody who doesn't put their children in school will be arrested by the police and I mean, in prison. So I said, sir, who ever told you a thing like that? Why do you say, say, listen, the thing is, you, you, you are arrogant. You think that what you want is what everybody should want. You want everyone, every child, uh, to, your child to go to school. All those little children playing in the doors to become lawyers and doctors. That is you. That's not us. So why must you push it in our mouth? And then I went, I went into the Senate a few months after that. I became a senator. Of, and all the way, the same things Yes, uh, Professor, we know that you have the goodwill. Your father, Wolowo, has the goodwill. Uh, he, and he has the capability to make this country uh, mightily different, successful, and everything. But we don't want it. So one morning in 1982, early in 1982, I went to Sichifal. My heart was troubled. Why are we among people we are trying to do th good things for and they don't want it? Why are we pushing ourselves 
Papa said, okay. Banji, you are a young man. You are a young boy. You are a boy. We must keep doing what we are doing. I said, why, sir? He said, because you never can tell. A time may come when they will want it. The Fulani are backward, uh, educationally. And uh, they don't want education in the house of Northwest, which they control, uh, control. The result is now they have produced a major product, a frightening product, the Almagiri. Masses, masses of agile, healthy young men who don't have education, who don't have any skills, who are just whose only prospect in life is to be beggars in the streets. Now, sir, in page 46 of your publication, you mentioned that to win election or re-election among his own people, each state governor knows that he has to have the factor of the Fulani barons who control the election rigging machineries from Abuja. Yeah. Please, could you there give are, some insight there, into There that? are no elections in Nigeria. Everything is cooked up. It's a cooked up stuff. The, uh, Nigeria has put together a machinery, a system, a tradition uh, by which elections are determined. If, you are, if, if that system rejects you, you cannot win an election in Nigeria. So Nigeria is a country where a candidate can win the election handsomely at the polls. Win the election handsomely at the polls and lose the election later in the evening in the office of the Electoral Commission. <laughs> that's, that's Nigeria. Very true. That's the reality. <laughs> yeah. That's the reality. Thank you so much, Professor Banji Akintoye. It's Thank been a you. privilege having this intellectual conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, dear viewers, for tuning in to Gold TV Africa. Here we conclude the interview with Professor Adebanji Akintoye. Enjoy the rest of your day.